Molly Barnes. My guest today is Martin DeRazzo. Martin is a very well-known artist here on the West Coast. He just had a show at the Otis Art Institute. He also has a gallery on Pico in West Los Angeles and uh, so he really is wearing two hats but probably three or four as we get to know him. Welcome Martin. Well, Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was just so excited to see that you were coming with your new haircut. No, oh, thanks. Thanks. Uh, had a friend uh, refer me last minute and uh, it seemed to work out. Do you think there's a big alignment between showbiz and art biz here in LA? Uh, it, I think it's an interesting parallel. You have uh, this industry that, that seems to be the uh, momentum, the force uh, of economic interest in the city and the art world seems to take a little bit of a back seat to it. Absolutely. It's like Washington DC where the uh, the senators and the president are right. the stars. New York City it's the artists that everybody reveres. Right. But can you use that for your work as an artist and also as a gallery owner? I, I think that it drives my artwork. You look at uh, that idea of having uh, an industry that, that bases itself on these things that are manufactured constantly that aren't real. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the deterioration that that creates, I think, can only inspire artists and uh, give a fresh new direction for art that's being made on the, on the West Coast. Martin, you grew up here in Los Angeles. When did you realize you first wanted to be an artist? What was the moment? Wow, that's interesting. Uh, I think I've always had creative impulses ever since I was a child. But growing up and uh, going to college and... Was the mother and father, either of them, artists? No, no. Uh, my mother had an appreciation for, for literature, and uh, I think that helped me with my appreciation for literature. And when I attended Pitzer College, I had it in my mind that uh, I was going to be a literature major, which I was. And midway through... Had you saw a piece of art, and what no, was no, it? No, no, no. It was actually the other way around. One of my sociology professors saw a piece that I had made and struck up a conversation uh, about the work that I was making and he became very interested and suggested that I speak to the art faculty at Pitzer and at that time I was preparing to go to England for a study abroad program and was told about this Boston University program that that had internships in art and he said you know you may not follow this you may stick to, to literature but why not give it a try I mean uh, you might really enjoy it. And I'm like, well, okay, fine. So I did, and it was pretty fantastic. I had a great situation in which I was given a studio in an artist-run space, which is interesting now that, that uh, myself and uh, my friend Robert Miller run an artist-run space. Uh, so when I came back, uh, I showed the work that the body of work that I'd made to the art faculty, and they allowed me to complete a, a double major in the rest of my time at Pitzer. Who was the first artist that turned you on? Wow. Let's say uh, living, somebody at yeah, Pitzer, well, somebody that you came into contact with. At, at, at this time, when I was at Pitzer, this is uh, between 86 and 90. In 85, leading up, right when I was starting college, I became interested in the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat and that whole uh, kind of young New York Raw. Movement. Basquiat was interesting because he had had no training and suddenly he was a star. I used to see him at parties with Larry Gagosian and he'd have on roller skates, he'd have on earphones and he was a real phenomenon and I had understood that Larry Gagosian said I could make this guy a star. He collaborated with Andy Warhol and had an amazing career. Unfortunately died very young. Mm -hmm. Was uh, was he a big influence on you? I, I believe so. Early on it, what I took from his work and, and the other artists of that time, like Keith Haring and, and Kenny, Kenny Scharf, seemed like there was this great energy and the ideal situation of artists really letting go of inhibitions. And so you had this artist that had incredible energy, 
and made this work, which I thought was pretty subversive because you had a painter who, who was making these childish like scrawls that people kind of identified with. But at the same time, if you really looked at them, they were pretty sophisticated. Very sophisticated, yeah. And so I, I, that really turned me on. I'm like, wow, not only that, his composition and use of color I thought was pretty fantastic. And uh, the issues that, that he wasn't afraid to deal with, the, the, the position of, of the black man in America, which you think uh, isn't necessarily something you want to get into when you're trying to, to make art for the collector base in New York. But much later we discovered he came from a very sophisticated family. His father was Puerto Rican and was an accountant and it was uh, much a different story than what we got. Uh, Julian Schnabel did a film, Basquiat, about mm -hmm. his life and his mm -hmm. contributions to art and also his struggle as an artist. Did you find that a good film? I thought it was. I was, I was really impressed, uh, which is interesting because I've always held on to Julian Schnabel as, as an influence uh, and even more so now as a filmmaker. I think that, that his vision carries through uh, and it was a really good movie for his first film. I uh, went to a, a lecture he did at UCLA about 10 years ago and he mm -hmm. got up and he said, I'm going to be more famous than de Kooning. And it was disgusting, but somehow we all believed him. I mean, he just was so confident. Well, I, I, it's, it's funny how we are some, somehow enraptured and repulsed by someone who's goal oriented. Exactly. I don't think there's any problem with, with thinking that you're going to be more famous than, than Willem de Kooning because we can walk one block down and ask 20 people who Willem de Kooning is and they're going to go, who? Yeah. You yeah. Know? However, there may, maybe one of those 20 people may have stumbled across the film Basquiat on cable or uh, might have heard of, of Before Night Falls. But uh, going back to Basquiat, just because his, he didn't come from abject poverty doesn't mean that he didn't have uh, a tough uh, Absolutely. childhood or even a young adulthood. I mean, I think uh, we go through our torments of, of growing up and then having uh, that idea that, that you're, you have your own self-worthiness and then having a lot of attention you know, placed upon you. It must have been incredibly hard for him. Martin, what's your work like? What's my work like? I, currently, and I would say for the last three or four years, uh, it's predominantly object-based work. Which means? Uh, everyday objects. You, you can, uh, you'll find everything from uh, water bottles to videotapes to uh, soil, potting soil, to as recently as sticky rice, Asian sticky rice, uh, in, in its dry form, paired with uh, construction levels, uh, with clamps, plexi, plexi sheets and fluorescent lights, uh, you name it. Artists always go back into the past and, and use it as a vehicle for the future or for themselves. Let me ask you about a couple of people and tell me how they influenced you. Okay. Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp. Uh, offhand, and my immediate reaction is that, that I don't always think of him as an influence. I think of it as an influence from other people making those associations, and I don't uh, fight them off. I think there is a, a clear association, a clear connection, and uh, so it's good to look back and say, okay, there is a tradition of this. And it's interesting because people, unless they're well-versed in art history, think of of something that was made yesterday as something completely new and revolutionary and if it takes the little bit of uh, uh, the smallest part, bit of effort in looking back 10, 20, 50 years you'll see that there's a tradition of it. I think the reason I asked you about Duchamp is that he felt ready-mades, his ready-mades were more important than art, particularly painting. For example, he used a urinal and put that on a pedestal and made that a piece of art. He took, um, I'm trying to think of some other things he did that, uh, where he made things that you, oh, a bicycle wheel, mm -hmm. and put that on a pedestal and said, this is more beautiful than any sculpture you could compose. He was a mentor for people like Peggy Guggenheim and later mm -hmm. artists, but I felt that your ready-mades were very similar, your object-oriented right. items. Right, and, and uh, my interpretation of that is that looking at the greater population, I mean, we survive 
on a daily basis with art and we're not aware of it. I'm, and I'm talking about the masses. We, we cannot get by without uh, looking and appreciating objects for their artistic quality. We, we buy clothes, we buy cars, we look at homes for these qualities of texture and shape and line and color without ever really articulating it. It always boils down to, oh, I like that. Now that looks all right. That looks comfortable. I think I want to wear that. And not making the associations to, to artwork. And That's um, Ashley Bickerton, the painter, that was his whole thing, was using labels and logos to define himself, to mm -hmm. do a portrait. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the influence of Jasper Johns on your work. Jasper Johns, again, um, you know, as a student, you, you study these people, and, and uh, Jasper Johns, believe it or not, I, I look at his objects, and, and I'm still more uh, attracted to his paintings. What about Robert Therrien? Robert Therrien, again, you know, having met him, uh, looking at his objects, I think they're, they're beautiful, um, but it's not something that, that I draw upon. Uh, the artists that I draw upon are people like Jessica Stockholder, uh, Paul McCarthy, who's one of my instructors at UCLA and continues to be. You're kidding. Yeah, no, no, no. He's, I would say he was one of my greatest influences and continues to be someone I can talk to from time to time. Uh, Adrian Sachs at UCLA, who brought me into the ceramics department and, and I think is an amazing artist. Um, the list can go on. Matthew Barney, you look at Jason Rhodes, I mean, it, and these are people who who weren't afraid to take from different places in, in uh, everyday life. So You talk about the masses a lot. Do you feel that the art world is a very small world? Um, yes. I do too. Uh, it's absolutely one of the great things Tiny. about your gallery is that it's non-elitist. You sort of, everybody's kind of hanging around, art is spoken, but it's not anything that is a, a frightening experience or a turnoff. I, I think that was the whole idea behind the space, uh, especially when Robert and I opened it up. Uh, we thought maybe it, it would last a total of, of six months, and now it's been about seven years. I thought, well, you know, we'll do it. A show or two, and show the people we think are, are neat. You know, as a non-art term, you know, neat, nice people, and and we'll do that. And we've continued to do it because there's a need for it. Um, it's, I don't know. It, it to me, it's important to think of art as a real uh, vehicle for for dialogue. You know, we 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 can't live without it. Although people constantly try to continue their lives on a daily basis without it. It's like, oh, I don't need that. Think about education. It's the first thing to go. How, and what was it we just saw? Well, uh, we, we just saw a, a list of uh, recent works. Uh, there was an installation shot of, of the show that I did at, at uh, Otis uh, last year. Uh, I think it was listed as 1998, but it was actually last year. And I had a great opportunity to work with Ann Ayers, who was amazing and, and was able to, to work and understand my vision and help me achieve that show it was actually really amazing. That Ben Maltz Gallery is fantastic. It's a beautiful space and uh, Fred Fisher space. Yeah, yeah. She, she she was you know uh, brave enough to let me do what I do in that space and it, it, it was pretty amazing. And uh, the other piece, a couple of the other pieces, <laughs> there there was a a really simple piece which I've kind of been uh, leaning towards in the last. I don't know, six to eight months of kind of paring down all these all these objects down to maybe one or two to try to create more of a focus, not only for my viewer but for myself. And uh, evidence of that is is that piece, pitch, which uh, is a plexiglass laid on a dolly, but that's covered in white vinyl along with this really beautiful orange soccer ball. So it makes reference to to the soccer pitch, the field in which it's played. Um, so. I did that piece in relation to the view of soccer in the world, where you have this, this sport that's worldwide very popular, but not in America. And so it seems to take a, a back seat. You see children playing it, and that's great, and it's wonderful. But it's interesting, since we've created this machine of, of the NBA and the NFL, which you know, I'm big fans of, but soccer still is a powerful sport. And uh, it's that idea of, of taking the simplest object, a ball, and creating this worldwide phenomenon. 
So um, I think one of the first pieces, though, that, that was shown was uh, uh, a piece that I did when I was finishing up at UCLA called Untitled Prison Sculpture, which, again, uh, I think is at the central root of all my artwork, and it's that idea of uh, our human nature to survive despite whatever situation we're put into. And I'm fascinated on how people survive within themselves despite what they're subjected to. And, and prison is that, that thing that, that really first made me think about it. How do people survive when they're put into isolation, when they're put into uh, violent, possibly violent situations, the, paired with, with uh, this repressed sexuality? And, and how, does, how do you live? How do you survive? How do you make yourself, how do you create a pleasant situation for yourselves, even moment by moment? And, and what is the answer? Well, the, I think it's, it's for the individual. You, yeah. you have to have these, these... Well, for you. What, what's the answer for you? For me, and I, I, it's, it's a matter of surviving within my, my own mind. Uh, Jane Elliott, uh, who's, who's the retired teacher who, who was the inventor of, of the blue-eyed uh, experiment, which she did with children and she does now with, with adults, talks about how we've created a society of, of everybody that's considered the outside, people of color, women, gays, uh, and people with disabilities have had to be subjected to, to certain treatment, a certain treatment that, that, that makes them feel less than, than complete, but that the only way that they can survive and ultimately be strong, and if not become stronger, is by surviving in their own mind continually. You know, it's funny, um, Martha Jackson, who was a dealer in New York, told me that uh, Art dealers are one of four minorities, gay, Jewish, women, or alcoholics. <laughs> and I think that's changed since art has become more big business, but I still find that most art dealers really are in it for the love of the artists. Mm -hmm. And that's why in the past there have been so many women artists, art dealers, because they want to nurture. Right. I've done several films on art dealers. I did one on um, Holly Solomon, and I found uh, she was really interested in helping the artist, which just shocked me. I didn't realize that the depth of her caring was that great. How does that fit in with your scheme? How does that fit in? Uh, as someone who, who... As an art dealer, you're, you're right. wearing two hats. Well, it's funny because I don't think of myself as a dealer. I mean, it's hard to think of myself as a dealer because what we run is a project space. Yeah. We give artists the opportunity to, to have shows, present their vision, and then that's it. There isn't really a long-term commitment with our artists. We, people come to us, present ideas for a project, uh, per se, and then they do it. So if anything, I still see myself in, in the role of the artist. Uh, if I had to stretch it a little bit, someone who, who attempts a curatorial practice at times, because I Are do, you good at making money? Uh, as selling art? Yeah. Not really. I'm not, not really. either. I, I, I think that, that uh, Christian Hayes over at the uh, project had a quote recently in, uh, in Index Magazine. And he said, you know, in the art world, either you make a lot of money or you're broke. And he said, I'm still broke. You know? And this is someone who's pulled off opening two great galleries, one in New York, one here. I think we're going to so. see uh, one of uh, a scenes from one of your videos, which is entitled. <laughs> entitled. <laughs> it, uh, it's called "Suck It Up." It was part of my thesis program at uh, at UCLA, and it's a little, it's a farce on how to become famous in the art world, and it's based on the adult film industry. So you're going to look at some low budget. The pornography, por or should I say porn acting, so I guess that's what we'll look at now. How did you do this film? How did I do this film? Uh, oh, here it goes. Here, oh, here's let's some let's stills. The, yeah, yeah the, the, the way I did it was, I guess anybody, a microcosm of, of the independent film industry. You go out, you get people to invest in a, in a project, and once I did that, I, I had to do a lot of legwork because, again, as I talk about survival, you have... This industry. So this is my jail cell sculpture. I think it speaks for itself. Hmm. I feel so vulnerable. Like I should be taken. Jail cell ah! style. I'm ah! gonna make you mine, bitch. Ah! Bend over. Ah! Suck my dick. Ah! I can't believe it. 
Uh, I can't either. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, now, I look at that. How long did it take that. you to make the film? Uh, we shot it all in one day. I, it took me about six months on the project to put it all together to make it culminate in that one day of, of shooting. Uh, the, the hardest part, again, the, the whole project had to do with human perseverance, human survival. You have these actors in an industry, you know, based on, on openness with, with sexuality and living in... Did I see Miss Spade in the corner of that? Oh, no, no, no. That's in the later scene. I, I'm sure we'll, we'll get take a look at that. Maybe in the still, you did. Yeah, uh, I Sue did. Miss Spade. Uh, and uh, Jane Hart were, were nice enough to come in and do cameo roles for me on that day. Uh, One of the loving, the things I love the most about the art world is you can do anything, and nobody has time to get an organization or a union to come in and tell you you can't do it. In New York, I do a group of readings and plays and have people, I did one on Harold Rosenberg and his double life before he died, his wife finding out about his mistress and the family, like Charles Kuralt. Right. And before people can say, you can't do that, you've already done it. I find mm -hmm. that so exciting that there's real freedom in the art world. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, why? Because there isn't as much of a threat. If it's on a wider venue, if, if you're on Channel 4 on, and you're going to do this, you're going to affect a lot of people and potentially threaten um, an income or a legality. In the art world, it's, it's a comforting space. Again, like the adult video industry, it's actually a pretty small protected arena. So we're able to do these things. and. I try not to lose sight of it while so many artists and people involved in the art world think, wow, you know, I, I'm this big fish in a big pond, but it's not the situation. I mean, what is sexuality like in the art world? Do you find people are pretty uptight or the people we think are so sophisticated and uptight are actually swingers? You know what? That, that, that's, I think that's the case in, in any situation. The, here, the, the, here. The, people, the people who are swingers they're going to be swingers, and we're not going to know about it. Yeah. I mean, they could be politicians, priests, whatever. And we yeah. know this. Yeah. We yeah. know this. So I don't think the art world's any different. I think you have the same amount. The only thing that you do have in the art world are people who fashion themselves as incredibly liberal and are not. That's absolutely true. We're going to see another one of oh. uh, another shot of the uh, film. There's okay. so much good art going on in Los Angeles right now. I just don't understand why we haven't seen any really, really good work. It's very frustrating to me. I don't think we haven't come in contact with the right artists. It all seems like a rehash of the 60s and 70s. Well, I think that we should take a look at this new artist. I hear he does great work. Very provocative. I'm sick of safe art. Mm, I'd be curious to see his work. I think it's time for this museum to be more adventuresome. Well, look, here he is now. Mm. This is the museum board. Mm. Yeah, I can tell from the looks of your faces, you're definitely bored. Well, maybe my work can change all that. I'm definitely here to show it to you. <sighs> However, you're going to be required to participate. That's something for you. That's something for you. And you're going to be involved a little more. I call this piece my moving sculpture, my voyeuristic moving sculpture. I think you'll like it. that. <laughs> whoa! Whoa, whoa. I remember once when I had my gallery in the 60s uh -huh. and uh, John Copeland, who was the editor of Art Forum, came in one day and he, we were all having cocktails after the day, all the art dealers on the street, mm -hmm. all women. And he said, how do you pick your artists? And we all said, good looking men. We were being facetious, but it right, does right. help. We have so little time. I want to ask you something about uh, uh, since 9-11, my opinion has been that art has gone from uh, kind of up your, well, uh, Jeff Koons, <laughs> kind of a sense of irony, and uh, we've gotten back to much more of a romantic or peaceful kind of uh, comforting art. Do you uh, find that true? Uh, I, I'm going to give you a yes and no. And uh, 
I'm going to say yes because we want to comfort ourselves after such an event. Uh, so the people that are going to control what's being shown, the dealers, the uh, curators, want to buy into that because they want the comfort. Uh, the people who are buying the art, same thing. They're, they're going to be, I'm assuming, less inclined to go buy controversial, violent, scary art at this time. They want to be comforted. In terms of the artists, I'm sure, just like everybody else, we've been just as affected. Uh, myself personally, I think I was already moving towards a calmer pace with my work. In general, I believe that, that artists are going to make the art that they are going to make. Uh, so it, in general, I think artists will continue to make the violent work, they'll make the calm work. Are they all going to make a change? No. Thank you, Martin. It's been a real treat having you here today. I just love your gallery. I love your art and I'm uh, so glad that um, that's just sort of guiding our future in terms of what will happen in the art world in the next 20 years. Good luck at the Thank Armory you. Show in New York. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Molly Barnes. See you again next time.